welcome to the Leaderism series. Today, we have with us Karen Hurd. Karen helps human-centered leaders resolve workplace ambiguity so that they can drive innovation, productivity, and revenue without burning out employees. Karen has co-founded Let's Grow Leaders, a world-class training leadership firm focused on home human-centered leadership development for those determined to break through results. Recently, she was named by Incorporated Magazine as a top 10 leadership speaker Karen is also an award-winning author for four of her books. Welcome, Karen. It's an honor to have you with us today. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. To begin with, Karen, uh, to introduce our audience to your journey, you're a leadership expert, a coach, and an author. Can you share a few highlights of your journey and what it's been like all the way for you? So I spent, before founding Let's Square Leaders, I spent two decades at Verizon. So the first uh, 10 years was human resources, leadership development, organizational development, merger integration. And then I moved into a variety of large team operations assignments. So I led a 2200 person sales team, a 10,000 person customer service organization. And then my last role there was to work with all of our outsourced call center uh, companies that were taking Verizon's calls. And Verizon had just started selling the iPhone and because AT&T had had exclusive rights before that. So they had ramped up all these call centers really, really quickly. And that had created a very negative customer experience. So they asked me because I do culture change and was known for that. They asked me to come and help all these other companies, you know, focus and get, get focused on the right things and give people the training and the development and the coaching that they needed. So I'm in there doing this basically consulting with these, we're actually the client, but I'm trying to help raise performance. And I start realizing how transferable my skills are to do that kind of work. And that not, I could just not lead teams, I could help teach companies how to change their culture. So I was starting, I, as I was going along with this, I started writing a blog, Let's Grow Leaders. And the blog started uh, taking off. It got an international following and people started calling and saying, hey, will you be our keynote speaker? Uh, when are you writing your book? And I still had this day job at Verizon. And I, after a moment, I, was, I did accept one of the keynote speaking gigs and I got off the stage and Shep Hyken, who was president of the National Speakers Association at the time and very well-known customer service expert says to me, hey, when are you leaving Verizon? I said, did I, did I say that from the stage? And he says, no, 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 you're clearly meant to do this, which really got me thinking. And so I went back and I gave Verizon a four months notice and said, I'm going to do this. And so I founded Let's Grow Leaders at that moment. So right now it's been nine years and we really, we work with companies all over the world. It's really been a wonderful journey to help them with really practical tools and techniques. That's you know, that's the reason I have, because of that background, that's why I know what works. And to do that in a human-centered way is really our mission. Wow, that's truly inspiring, Karen. Especially now that I've read a lot of blogs that are there on uh, Let's Grow Leader, I understand how everything is totally human-centered and revolved around what the workplace and the humans that, that honestly work there are truly the center of the workplace. And I understand how that thought process has come to so uh, on the same question, on the same lines, I have another question for you, Karen. The firm that you co-founded, Let's Grow Leaders, shows how important that developing the right kind of leaders is for you and your strong passion towards it. What inspired this interest for you in this field? And what has been one situation that truly drove you to developing leaders? And what inspires you to keep doing this? You know, it's interesting. You, you, I always say you can learn as much from a bad boss as a good boss. And uh, there, were, there were a couple of experiences, uh, particularly towards the end, uh, where I was watching very senior leaders uh, operate in a non-human centered way. And I was watching what happened. So, in, and there was one person in particular, I won't share their name, but it was, it was fascinating because the people right below her were encouraging her, right? Telling her she was doing so great, but this toxic, toxicity, right? That she was spreading. I was watching what it was doing to the culture. And I thought she, her behavior, she thinks are working and they're actually destroying what she's trying to build. And I thought, ah, it's, it's, it's tragic. It's tragic for so many reasons, right? It's tragic for the business. It's tragic for the humans. It's tragic for her. 
And I thought, you know, I can help with this because you don't have to act like that, right? In order to be a, a strong leader. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. And so the reason I was thinking about growing leaders is how do you help people with the tools and techniques to do that well so they don't feel compelled to lead with shame, blame, or intimidation because they have other strategies that can work. And so that's really what, that was really a, a trigger moment for me that said, hey, this is my life's work. This is what I'm supposed to be doing next. Wow, that's truly very nice to hear about that, Karen. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, moving on, Karen, to the third question. In a few articles that I noticed on Let's Grow Leaders, you talk about speaking up and sharing your ideas at work, which, which truly struck me and is quite interesting to understand. What, according to you, are the few tips that you can give leaders to encourage a culture where you let people speak up and you uh, understand what people are saying? And also, on the other side of the argument, how can you uh, tell, uh, motivate young leaders or give them tips to be fearless at work and speak up from their side? Yeah, so our latest book is called Courageous Cultures, and it's based on extensive research on just this topic, on speaking up, sharing ideas, psychological safety, and what prevents it. And what kind of so curious about what is preventing people from speaking up is that we were noticing a consistent pattern. We would go in and work at the senior levels of organizations, and we would hear things like, gosh, why don't people speak up more? Why don't people bring their ideas to the table? And then we would go in and do training at the front line of the same organizations. And we would hear, nobody ever uh, wants my ideas anyway. Nothing ever happens. Why bother? And we thought, are you working for the same company? Because most leaders really do want ideas and uh, you know, employees have them. And yet somehow there was a disconnect. So we set out on a, a pretty extensive research study to answer this couple of questions. When people were holding back ideas, what kinds of ideas were they holding back? And they weren't trivial. It wasn't like, oh, I wish we had kombucha in the break room or virtual Taco Tuesdays. They said they were holding back ideas to improve the customer experience, the employee experience, or productivity in a process. And then when we asked why they were holding back their ideas, 40% lacked the confidence to share their ideas. 49% uh, said they're not regularly asked for their ideas. 50% said nothing ever happens. 67% said my manager operates around the notion of this is the way we've always done it. So what we've learned from that is that you can't just say, I have an open door. Because for most people, it really does take courage, some level of courage to still walk through an open door. You've got to proactively ask people for their ideas. And as, as, mo as specific as you can be as possible with that, hey, do you have one idea that can improve the productivity of this process? That doesn't feel very intimidating to people. Or what is one way we could improve communication on this team? What is one way we could improve our collaboration? And so that you build up to asking people for their ideas. And uh, so we, we have a seven step process, but the four, you know, the first four are navigating your own narrative. What are, are you modeling the way? Are you speaking up? Do your employees see you doing that? Because if you're telling them it's safe, but you're not acting safe, like it is safe, they're watching. Then creating clarity, clarity about two things. One, clarity that you, that you really want people's ideas, but then also clarity about where you need ideas. Do people get the strategy? Do they get the vision? Do they have enough information to bring better ideas? And then cultivating curiosity, going out and proactively asking people for their ideas. And then this fourth step is very important, responding with regard, how you respond to an idea, even if it's an idea that you can't use and you respond with gratitude, information and invitation. Now you asked for the flip side of that. If you are listening to this and you say, yeah, well, I'm nervous. How do I speak up? One way we train people to do that well is through our idea model, positioning your ideas in this way. So say you have an idea that you think will improve the business. Maybe it will uh, improve productivity or may, let's say it's gonna save the business $10,000, all right? Or, so you say, okay, hey boss, I have an idea that's it's going to save us this amount of money. Would you be interested in hearing it? Now, your manager is going to say yes, right? If you have a compelling first line. And so that's, that's why I, this idea is interesting. Now, D, doable. 
Now here's where you explain the high level of why this idea will work. You know, this is, these are the three steps that I think we need to take. I, interesting, D, doable, E, engaging. Who else might need to be involved? I've already checked with HR to see if it's okay. I've already talked with finance to see. I've already checked with compliance to see if this, right? I've already talked with my peers and everybody said they'd be willing to change the way they answer the call in the first, uh, you know, their first 40 seconds, whatever it is. And then A, actions. What are a couple of recommended first next steps? Here's where I think we need to start. So if you position your idea in that way, here's why it's interesting, doable, engaging, actions. Even if your manager does not use your idea, they are going to, you're going to come across as somebody who cares deeply about the business and is articulate and a critical thinker. You can't lose in a way like that. And so that can help reduce that fear. From, from what I understand is not, it's not really how, what you ask. It's about how you're putting it to actually make that more impactful. And that results in you having more attention towards what you're saying. And actually what you're saying or speaking up matters to someone else. So now thank you for sharing those tips with us, Karen. Truly helpful. Uh, moving on, Karen, with your depth of knowledge about leadership, you must have a vision of what it might be in the future. Can you tell us more about what this what this might be and what are some steps that leaders can take to prepare for the future of work? Yeah, we are at a really interesting time with the future of work because, you know, the pandemic absolutely shifted how, where get work gets done, how people collaborate in such a sudden and dramatic way that we weren't really prepared for. It wasn't like, oh, there was this movement and a gradual deliberate move to work from home. It was, it, we, you know, company after company who, and said, we will never have people working from home. On a Tuesday, made a decision. On a Wednesday, everybody was working from home. And I think that because of that sudden move, it, it was not done as smoothly and as um, deliberately and with the right training and support infrastructure as it needed to. And so what you're seeing now is companies trying to catch up and saying, all right, what is the future? Should it be fully remote? And you know, some of those, should it be hybrid? Should we make everybody come back? And you're watching as all these companies experiment with these different choices. And what I think is you're going to see uh, the companies that do this well are going to take a step back and they are going to really think about the impact about where work gets done and how work gets done. And then how they're, and not just make their decisions based on real estate savings or, or what the employees say they want at this moment, because it's, a, I'm not sure everybody knows exactly what they want at this moment. And how do you start with the vision of what you need to accomplish? We need people really collaborating. We need people really being strategic. We need, you know, we need this kind of customer experience. Start with that vision. And as if you were building it from scratch, and then say, what, is the, how, what are the ways we're gonna work? Where are we going to work? Because one of the same things I'm seeing people, mistakes I'm seeing people make right now is they're like, well, it was working from home is kind of working pretty good. So I guess we should, and the employees say they like it. So I guess we should do that. But what I'm also starting to see is a backlash of um, lonely employees, people who are feeling disconnected. So without that uh, ability, you're, and so you're going, I think you'll see less loyalty because there'll be less connection to organizations and you're gonna see even more moving around um, and dissatisfaction, potentially more quiet quitting as the, you know people are calling it now than, than you have, unless you create a way to really be deliberate about your culture in that context. So I think culture is going to be at the top of the conversation, should be at the top of the conversation uh, to drive the results that you need in a human-centered way. Yeah, wow. that's that's a very well way, good way to put it. The culture is going to be the highlight, and it might be, we are not certain about what might what the future might be, but I'm hoping it's going to be good. Moving on to the final segment of the interview, uh, Karen, do you have any final anecdotes that you'd like to share with our audience and to know more about your book, uh, Courageous Culture? Where can our audience find that and what is it about? Yeah, so, uh, you know, one of the things I would just encourage you to, to think about and your listeners to think about is, you know, there's a lot of times where we say, I wish my boss were different. I wish the culture were different. 
And I would encourage you to be the courageous leader you want your boss to be, to create a cultural oasis is what we call it, to say, where's my sphere of influence? And how can I impact that? And because it can feel, you know, it can feel overwhelming, right? I worked for a gigantic company, but, but I could concentrate on my sphere of influence. And that I found huge satisfaction for 20 years, making an impact in my space. And uh, so when you feel frustrated, look around and say, can I contribute an idea? Can I ask people for an idea? Can I um, influence this customer experience at this moment in this way? So that you're taking pride and satisfaction and connecting back to the, why you do the work that you do would be my last piece of advice. And our, our book is called Courageous Cultures. How to Build Teams of Micro Innovators, Problem Solvers, and Customer Advocates. And uh, this is really a way to, how do you build that cultural oasis for you? How do you create an environment where you feel confident speaking up, where you're making a difference? And how do you do that for your team? So you don't need to be the CEO to read this book, although there are CEOs reading this book, but it can work for you and your small team as well. Awesome. Thank you, Kara. Thank you for sharing that with us. This was truly a great interview. We're happy to have you have you with us today. Thank you for uh, joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.